good afternoon or good morning or good evening wherever you are <laughs> if you're joining the live stream today welcome uh and if you're in if you're joining us on youtube later i hope you uh, get some value out of this uh, live pairing session we've got lined up today today i'm pairing with uh michael how do i pronounce your surname uh, visco <laughs> visco okay yeah um and is a tester from Bratis Bratislava? Yeah, Bratislava, Slovakia, sure. <laughs> okay, cool. Do you mind uh, telling us a bit about yourself before we jump into today's session? Um, sure. I've been doing testing for about five years now. I actually started as a Ruby developer uh, way back. And I got into testing when I was changing cities and looking for new jobs and I couldn't find anything in Ruby. So I like widened my search, found a testing job in Python for like some automation and kind of stuck with that since. Uh, and I always say that I, I found myself uh, since then uh, and never, never wanted to go back to development. Um, like testing became my gem, I would say. Um, I've worked in several companies, all of them were like small and agile teams. So even though my official assignments always were automation based, um, in such small teams, like whatever you need to be done, you need to do it yourself. So I've touched basically everything that I can think of when it comes to testing. Um, and I'm kind of really, um, I, I, I am really, really happy that I did because it, it brought a lot of experiences that I can leverage now. Uh, and yeah, I, I believe that every single experience that you have in, in like work related stuff is um, something you can leverage in the future and it's transferable. So even like experiences that are not necessarily like testing connected, I have transferred. Um, and I believe like that is definitely like part of, of success professionally to, to be able to do that. Um, so you said you uh, mentioned you came from a Ruby developer background and then moved into Python automation. Um, yep. to, which one, if we were to pit the two languages against each other, Ruby versus Python, uh, what are, what are some of the benefits of Ruby over Python? I mean, on the surface, they look very, very similar. They're both like object oriented and the the way that they treat different objects and different like transitions from, from and between types. Like this is very, very similar. The syntactic sugar there is many times very similar. Um, for me personally, Ruby always felt a little bit nicer. It might be a bias because I started with it uh or or something i have no idea on the other hand python has like definitely bigger support uh, due to like academia usage and and stuff like that so um it's it's hard to say like which one is which one is better i like ruby more but if i had to pick i would probably go for python just because of the support and uh stuff like that mm, i think there's for uh anyone locally uh, PyCon AU, I think, is coming up very soon. I think it's online. I'm just going to do a shout out to, to PyCon 2021. Um, um, but PyCon has been, yeah, coming up on the 10th to 12th of September. Um, I think they're doing this one all online. Uh, but the PyCon conference has been one of the best technical conferences uh, that I've attended. I guess I was a little bit biased because it was my first uh, tech conference uh, a few years ago. Um, and I just really enjoyed the community and the talks were always interesting. And if I attend developer conferences, that's usually a little bit more outside of my comfort zone. I tend to learn a bit more. There's more things on data science and design and all of these considerations that I don't, I, I don't get to experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Is there a similar Python conference in Europe? Honestly, I have no idea. I it, it's been it's been some years now since I last worked with Python on on a daily basis. Um, so I kind of like fell out of that. Uh, I was looking more towards testing conferences these days. 
Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, if anyone wants a link or there's, there's a conference for everyone. Uh, testing <laughs> conferences page. Um, upcoming, we've got Apply Tools, Future of Mobile Testing, uh, Asia Pacific. I'm not biased or anything because I'm not speaking. Well, I am speaking at this one, but sh sh I'm not not biased towards this one. <laughs> um, and this is usually a good page, testingconferences.org, for keeping up to speed with uh, uh, conferences that may be happening as well. But with the uh, in the in the times of COVID, it can be quite hard to attend uh, online conferences. I'm only just starting to attend uh, online conferences. Has there been a favorite conference you have heard of or attended? Uh, this year, I really enjoyed Felkion. Um, you spoke at that one, I believe. Um, that was really, really nice one. Um, like embracing the failures is always a, a great thing to do. Uh, and I enjoyed that one a lot. Um, so yeah, if, if I had to pick one, if I have to pick one this year, this, this will be the one. Hmm. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that one. I didn't really get to stick around for as many talks as I would have liked. Uh, but still it was. It, it's good to see the community trying to drive um, online-based conferences. Uh, it can they can be quite hard to get decent engagement. Cool. Uh, now back to what we're going to pair over today. We're going to talk about. I'm going to hide that one. Um, the the shift left mindset, uh, which is all the rage these days. So. <laughs> Uh, in your own words, would you like to give us like a brief overview of what's involved with Shift Left? Sure, I can. I can try and tell you like how I see the, the the topic, how I see the problem. In in my eyes, it's about moving the testing uh, more towards like the front of of what is happening. Um, this making it happen sooner and making sure that everybody is more involved. Um, because like in, in very traditional way of, of developing software, there will be somebody who's talking to customers first and then somebody who decides what to do and then somebody who implements that. And then in the end, somebody who is like a quality gatekeeper, right? And when we are like taking on the, the agile uh, mindset and, and like trying to, trying to do things like more swiftly and, and maybe fail faster, then it's really important to also like test sooner um, to, to maybe not test the final product, but to test the underlying ideas first, um, stuff like that. So anything that makes the testing efforts go and happen sooner in the process uh, is, is uh, covered in, in, in this, in this, I would, I would say. Mm. Yeah, there's this uh, pre there's this perception that um, if you're building software, you know, someone goes through the design, they gather the requirements, then you know they go through analysis, um, do some prototypes, talk to customers, ask developers to build the things, and then at that point, it's handed over the wall to the to the testers and go, hey. Test this thing, please. I mean, like at the end yeah. of the day, even waterfall projects don't work on on that way anymore. And I like to think of testing as building in feedback loops at the right stage. Um, and yeah. I view like the shift left mindset is about encouraging the the like trying to think about what feedback loops you want to build at that development stage. To, to enhance the code quality at that layer. Definitely. I, I have the feeling that um, for many people involved, um, when they talk about testing, they have in mind something similar to a output quality control in a um, like factory. You know, like there are cars coming down the factory line and in the very end, there is a guy with like white gloves that's checking that there is no scratches on the on, on the bonnet or something. And and like I have the feeling that people are viewing 
testing as sort of like this sort of like out output quality control basically um which is really sad because um mainly today when we can like patch anything on the on the fly and we are doing like multiple deployments a day this sort of role doesn't really make sense at all um and there is another role in in the factories um that is never called testing it's always like research and development or, or something similar but their goal is to give the the immediate um feedback loop and and to like give information to to somebody who matters like hey this process will not go well or hey there is this issue that will cause us to i don't know stop the factory for three days if we don't resolve it right away or something similar and this is in my eyes the more important uh part of our work as testers in, in software as well um it's just hard to get people to recognize this and the, yeah just as, as as you said like if we can put these feedback loops into the early stages of development like everything goes smoother faster cheaper um so yeah that th those are the reasons why why the shift left is is so necessary and it's such a big buzzword these days yeah yeah i'm just marking some um um some comments to potentially talk about a little bit later so hmm? uh we to to kick things off in a way when a developer is thinking about quality what's the first thing that tends to come to mind with the we put the developer hat on and think about quality um in my experiences um developers tend to think about quality in and almost everybody on the team tends to think about the quality in a very positive seeking way as in okay i have this product and i'm trying to make it work and if it works as i expect if this one use case like goes through then everything is fine everything is working i can say this is a quality well done and like quality product this is leaving me and and, and they are done with that um developers see like internal quality of the code that is something that is very specific to them uh and they they do understand the need to like refactor the code and and do like address some tech depth and stuff like that but apart from that like my experience is that they just want the thing to be done right um and everybody on the team wants the thing to be done and everybody on the team just wants the thing to work apart from us because um we are trying to make the thing not work <laughs> right <laughs> so um yeah that, that is that is a big big difference i believe in in like mindset what's been one of your bigger challenges trying to get um someone to see your point of view when it comes to enhancing quality <sighs> um i believe that in in the years um i have met two challenges that i would consider big ones um one of the challenges is um lack of understanding what's going on and that sprouts a very unhelpful way of thinking when manager comes and they're like yeah we want to automate everything because we've heard somewhere it's cheaper and to that you only can say like well no <laughs> but to explain that uh it's it's sometimes difficult um it's it's the misunderstanding of the craft that is definitely like one one big problem um the second big problem and this is more tied towards the or well both of them are actually tied to it right because this misunderstanding of the craft is is um having the effect of of managers wanting the testers to be the quality gatekeepers to be the the end part of the solution like they don't really seek testers to be in the in the beginnings of the of the life cycle and the second problem is um that many times it feels to me like it's really difficult to make other people think 
of problems. Like it's it's very inherent to human nature to try to avoid problems. Like people don't want to people don't want to think about problems by by default. And it's it's very difficult to make people go like, hey, this could go wrong as well. Have you thought about that? Um, and not 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 many people have this uh, ingrained in ingrained in them. Like they are trying to avoid that as, as much as possible. Oh, that, that reminds me. There's uh, 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 just recently to to get my team to think about more about some of the problems that could go wrong with the work we've been working on is I played the Nightmare Headlines games. Have you had a have you heard of that before? No. Um, so, I didn't. Um, it's from a book called Explore It, How to Re Reduce Risk. Um, mm -hmm. Nightmare Headlines, um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Hendrickson, I think, yeah. Um, so the idea of the game, and I've run this as a retro, um, is that you bring everyone together, you set the scene, you go, you've come into work tomorrow and uh, the software you use uh, is uh, on your favourite app, uh, you know, the worst things happened. Your your software that you're working on is being featured in the news. What does what does that title say? Oh, I need to 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 log in. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a it's a brainstorming technique where you get people to brainstorm the worst case scenario, like what could go wrong with our software that would cause it to to be in the news tomorrow. And then oh, you can I loved it. you can reverse engineer it from there. And then you go, well, you know, pick your top five that you want to. We'll group them into broad categories of, and then uh, brainstorm what could contribute to that particular failing. Um, and you often can, and then you can generate charters where you might want to say you want to explore some security testing or performance testing. Um, a lot of those other elements of quality tend to come up in um, those types of uh, brainstorming sessions. I love this. Like already, so many ideas have popped up in my mind about the work I do. <laughs> well, okay. What was uh, what was some of the uh, nightmare headlines that came to mind when I was when I was talking about that? Um, currently, I'm working for a company that involves like processing of sport data um, for media houses and betting operators, advertisements, stuff like that. Anything that you can think of and contains words sport and data, we are probably having hands in that. Um, and the company has like pretty big um, impact uh, in in the market, and so since like the Olympics is on, uh, that that's just like offers itself to a couple nightmare scenarios, right? <laughs> um, um, something like uh, uh, big data. Oh, big data equals uh, big flop for the Olympics. Yeah, <laughs> why not? That is, that is a great one. Yeah, <laughs> big data equals big flop for the Olympics, or I don't yeah. know. You can you can have a bit of fun with that. Definitely, um, like many many are coming. Like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a fun little exercise that can I think can encourage teams to think about how their software can go wrong. And you're talking about this this challenge that it can be hard to think about or to get people to think about how their software can fail or how their product can fail as well. Yeah, definitely. And it's and it, it doesn't show necessarily just in like these big big things. It also shows like in in the small doubter details I was testing like I, I was having this this pair session with one developer and we were going through a, uh, a a product and we were expecting that it will throw us off like 403 unauthorized and that was the expected result we got 500 and the developer went yeah okay we have no content that's good I'm like no it's not because we have no idea why this failed and whether we will fail the correct way if necessary and and it's this sort of like they people don't want to deal with problems right like it was sort of working and and that was good enough for them 
Um, and it, it took me some time to really like get across that this might not be the ideal way to, to do things. Yeah. Um, how did you uh, convince the developer that, that there might be a bug to, to fix in that situation? Well, we are pair testing, so I just pushed pushed him a little bit and went like, okay, um, since we are here together, like let's let's check the logs, let's figure out why this is happening. Like this is this is not acceptable. And and they agreed in the end, like that it was not acceptable. If we expect some behavior to be happening, we we need to get to that point or or just like understand why we are not getting it at least. Um, it's it, it wasn't necessarily a problem to to persuade them um, that we should do that. It was the, the problem lied in, in the way that they just wanted to ignore it at, at, at first. And when we are trying to like, and, and what I'm trying to do is is maybe like offload a little bit of testing work towards developers um, in, in, the, in the great run. And this is actually a big hurdle for me because I need to be, I need to be sure that developers will think like certain way, I I need to be sure that they will not ignore this kind of problem when it when it comes up. Um, and if we want to shift left, if we don't have enough testers in the team, if we want developers to help with the testing, if we want developers to be included in the early feedback loop, we need to be sure that they, there is a certain like level of of the quality of thinking. I would even say. Yeah, I guess there's that um, trying to help trying to help someone develop those critical thinking skills so that instead of assuming that it's not a problem, it's like, well, at least we got some API error better than a 200. (laughs) Therefore, it's working. Perfect. Um, I guess like encouraging people to take a step back in that moment and go, hang on, that's that's not quite what I expected. It even shows to me that um like developers are not even used to forming um forming hypotheses before uh before they do their work or well they do in their mental models right but they are not very used to like explicitly stating them and if you create a hypothesis in your mental model it's easy to bend it if necessary um if you have it written down on paper it's much much more difficult um and that is actually curious to me because like test driven development has been a big buzzword as well in the scene for a long time and that is exactly that right you form a hypothesis first you then develop things and you test your hypothesis right it turns out that developers are not used to do this or at least the developers i'm i'm working with are not very used to do this um even though that they, they are saying they do develop in test driven way um it is still alien to them. Yeah. Um, I mean, like for anyone who's watching and who's a little bit out of touch with the terms we're using, uh, I'm just going to briefly explain explain hypothesis for anyone who may not quite understand, because it is unfortunately like one of those big words that has a lot of, uh, uh, it's a big word. Um, but it's like if you're running a science experiment uh, and you kind of like think that a particular thing is going to happen or work or it's like in your mind you you're like when I do this I'm going to get this result and so you can go through you can test your scenario you can go I when I think this I think this will happen and then you can also come up with scenarios called a negative hypothesis which is all about going well how can I prove that I'm wrong or brainstorm different ways if you think that the sun is going to rise every morning because there's a essential god in the sky that pulls a flaming chariot across the sky you're like how can I prove that wrong and I guess you could probably get like a telescope and try and look for the for the chariot Uh, but like looking at the sun is usually like a bad idea so (laughs) Uh, you are touching up on one very important point here, actually. Uh, you can't prove a positive hypothesis. You can only disprove hypothesis, right? You you, you never can with 
certainty say that yes, I am right. You only can with certainty say no, I was wrong. Mm, you can yeah. say with 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 some level of certainty that you were probably right, but you may never know that for sure, right? Mm. Uh, that's also like part of part of the the, the scientific approach. Yeah, uh, and I feel like testers tend to develop this mindset a lot more, but yeah. I think it's because we're often more thinking about the risks or how this could go wrong. Um, and we practice those critical thinking skills. Um, but when you've got like that builder mindset and you're trying to build stuff for a customer, um, it, which in itself is a challenging mindset to get into. Um, and it can be quite hard to change between, you know, the, I want to build something for customers versus I want to think about how this could break for customers. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, are, you are being spot on here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know what's better. What's a better term for that for that mindset? Is it the builder versus destroyer? A lot of people think testing is about destruction. No, testing is not about destruction. Not at all. Like testing is about providing information. This this is information business, and this is people business. We are we are working. Um, contrary to believe, like I, I talked to somebody uh, not long ago and they were like, yeah, this needs to be hard because you need to keep up with all the tech. And I'm like, you know, tech, that's just tools. I have to keep up with people and people are the same all the time, right? It's people who write the software. It's people who we, who we are serving the software. So this is, this is a people science in a way. Um, but we are definitely not, we are definitely not a, a destroyers. We might be problem seekers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that we that, that mindset that uh, testers testers enjoy breaking software, and it's not true because it was broken before we touched it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, we. But, uh, but we definitely. But we definitely are that sort of people who who see a a hive and we will poke. A stick inside of it just to see what happens mm. right <laughs> and i think it's one of those things it can feel like testers enjoy breaking software because when we're found where software is broken we can feel like we've we've actually done something useful we've found an issue <laughs> definitely rather than spend you know two or three hours trying to trying to find potential issues and you're like no the software is actually pretty good from my from my point of view. And this is also one of the reasons why it's really difficult to, um, sometimes it's, it's really difficult to, to output in a written way what we were doing, right? Because um, it doesn't seem like we were doing much, although we were, uh, just because there is sometimes not, not much evidence behind us like yeah nothing nothing broke for three days what were you doing well i was i was tested it <laughs> and and yeah. where are the bugs where nowhere you wrote good code for once <laughs> uh, yeah um that that actually brings up some i think uh michael bolton i think has got some blogs on telling the tester story can I search for uh Go on. They definitely there will be something like that because he speaks about these things a lot. Um Yeah, there there are there are quite a few blogs um on that. We'll just have a quick look through. So who needs the testers? Uh, one of the, the things with reading through Michael Bolton's blogs is that uh, sometimes they can take a little bit of time to process. So I can't quite quickly skim through uh, the story of their testing work. Oh, uh, yeah. So, the, you know, if you ask your question, how's testing going? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is definitely a very important skill for a tester to know how to talk about the work they are doing. Um, definitely. And what I what I really like to do um, 
when I am writing any sort of um, a- any sort of like write up on on an issue I found. It doesn't necessarily need to be a bug per se, but like some sort of issue that will hunt us um, on 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 the way down. Um, I really like to do this very structured way where I write one sentence of like, hey, what is going on? Just to give a, a brief um, context to, to the person who's reading it. Then I include one sentence that explains why it is important for them um, to read more and just to make sure that they are invested. And then I do the rest of the write up. And I, f- I feel like this is a very, very good technique to adopt um, because it, it allows me to like make sure that the information like goes through. I also like to add like some sort of maybe not solutions, but maybe ideas what, what can be helpful for, for the solution in the end. Um, but I am definitely not in a position to solve problems. I am in a position to give information, give feedback, maybe aid with the solving the problems, maybe maybe give hints, but definitely not solve them. Okay, I think we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into what makes a good bug report, because I think I found an image of a bad bug report. Uh, basically, subject, it doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, fix yeah. it ASAP. Okay. So, mm-hmm. great um, one. I'm I'm usually collaborating fairly closely with the developers on my team. Uh, my mm-hmm. favorite bug is one that never actually gets written because it's picked up during pair testing, um, or it's very casual. You know, I tap a developer on the shoulder and go, "Hey." I'm seeing some odd behavior. Do you think this is odd? And they're like, ha, ah, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll fix that. Um, but sometimes yeah. um, you do get bugs that come through from customers and whatnot, and they do need to be documented and kind of added to a backlog. And I really hate maintaining bug backlogs, but sometimes it happens. I try to only write bug reports into backlog in two occasions. A occasion is if a customer is the like writing from the production and it's it's something that is in the production and needs to be needs to be solved. And the second occasion is if we know about the bug but we decide not to tackle it right away um, mm. for whatever reason. And I have yeah. I have seen bugs that lived happily for half a year in an application and they were just not important enough to tackle it. And like okay. If 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 my like product owner decides that this is the way, then this is the way. It's it's their call. It's mm. my it's my work to give them the information. It's my work to tell them what the impact will be, and it's their job to decide whether they will go on with it or not. But those are the only two reasons why I would ever see a bug uh, filed mm, yeah. somewhere. Yeah, I always try to keep our bug backlogs intentionally low. Um, and going through exercises where it's like, well, uh, if these bugs have existed for more than six months, we just close them. Because if if they were important, we would have fixed them. And if someone else complains uh, that they wanted to fix it, we can just reopen the issue. Yeah, I, I can see logic in that, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the I think there's um, uh, an art to writing up a good bug report. Um, and a lot of people that I work with, uh, it takes a bit of time, I think, to practice this skill. It's a, it's an undervalued, uh, not well appreciated skill sometimes. Um, but what else do I you think is that... key? Oh, sorry, what were you One saying? More time, please. <laughs> uh, I would. I, I wanted to say that um, it probably stems from the very same reason why it is difficult for me, and and I'm trying to like shift back to the to the shift left thinking it is difficult for me to make sure that developers will document their testing properly um i am having this mindset that yes developers are checking their own work before they push the changes to production so if they check it and if they document it properly there is no need for testers to touch it again right like 
somebody checked it, so why should I check it twice? Um, it's really difficult for me to get developers to document it properly. They go through all the checks, they they confirm all their all their hypotheses, and they just forget to do a screenshot or they don't write what data they used or, or something similar. And I believe that the root cause is very similar in here as is in creating good bug reports. Like people are having hard times to think like what needs to be documented so it makes sense for somebody else. Just like converting the tacit knowledge they have in their heads into something explicit for somebody else to read. That is the core of, of the problem here, I believe. Yes. And that is definitely, yeah. just as you said, like that is definitely a hard skill and it's, it's a skill that needs to be trained. Um, it's one of the invisible ones, but definitely not an easy one. Mm. It, it's one of those things that as you go through your own experiences, um, the problems are really obvious to you. The reason why, or the reason why it's a bug, or how you managed to get that bug, or or why it's not working, um, completely obvious to you because you've got all of the context that led you to that point to decide that this is a bug. But someone else has to make the exact same journey or a similar journey, hopefully a shorter journey than your whole entire life experiences to be able to get to that same um, amount of information. And so you've got to try and make this gap. And so you have to, I guess, think about it from um, someone else's point of view. What information do they need to be able to assess the impact or to try and debug the situation? Uh, and I found, um, you know, usually a good title um, and you got like a why, why is this important, you know, potential impact to customers or the product owner is like, yeah, this is a bug and really wants it fixed, you know. Uh, um, and we are going to add what I said a few minutes ago, what is happening, why is it important for you? And then the rest of the stuff, right? How did I get there? What the steps were? Some image of what's going on, maybe environment where it's being done, the time that it, it happened because, hey, somebody might have pushed something in the mid, in the meantime. Yeah. Uh, the um, changes any, thing. So. Yeah, and any other information you think that might be relevant, yeah. but uh, you don't know if it's completely connected just yet. It's just like as you're investigating an issue, you also have a developer hypothesis of how you think it's broken, and then. Hopefully, before you write the bug report, you do a little bit of variation testing just to check that or confirm that it is what you think it is rather than it being yep. something else. And often I find people don't tend to try and disprove their own bug reports. Um, and, and like sometimes some debug logs or, or at least some ideas of like, I think it is uh, the line of code here. I think when we're passing in this variable, we're getting this type of error state. Um, haven't completely confirmed just yet, but if you can almost point to the to the way you think it's wrong in the code, it, it's a lot easier from a developer's point of view to um, pick it up. But if you're also collaborating with developers on your team, I would say like the next step to that is like if you can find roughly where it is in the code where it might be broken is potentially pairing with a developer while you just fix it side by side as well. Because that gives you both exposure to um, the code base and how things are working too. Yep, that's definitely the most like elegant solution to all of this because there is the least like overhead to that, right? It's, it's the leanest of the solutions. Mm. <laughs> and if you can avoid writing up some written documentation yeah. because written documentation is hard, and yeah. full of miscommunication. But you said one really interesting thing there. Um, you talked about how people are often not trying to disprove their own bug reports. And and I really liked this before because in, in my experience, and, and not, not only in my experience, like this is a, a very well-known bias, people do tend to not want, people want to, um, people want to uh, affirm whatever they know already, right? Mm. 
it's it's very very close to human nature, or, or, or it's it's very. Oh, I I am having a hard time finding the correct words. Um, words are hard. <laughs> uh, it, it's okay. It, it's it's very common for people to uh, try to affirm what they already know and and their their view of the world. And yeah, this book is is awesome. Yeah, just um, remind me of of this book called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. And basically, the analogy in the book is that we've got two modes of thinking in our brain: System One and System Two. Uh, we don't actually have these in our brain. It's just a mental model to think about how your brain works. Um, system One is your impulsive uh, mindset. It it actually does a lot of the driving, but we like to think that System Two is in charge and doing all the deep thinking. But your brain is, you know, maybe 5% of your body mass, but it consumes like 25% of your energy requirements. It is a heavy, hungry energy horse. And so to, to use less energy, um, your brain basically lets system one do a lot of the decision making. Um, because like we're lazy. Everyone has a lazy brain yeah. and no one wants to do system two thinking because it's expensive. It's exactly it's it's why humans like have so many habits right if 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 you've ever driven home and came came home and then you recollect no memory of how you got there it's it's exactly this like using system one hmm. and so maybe when we're going through writing up bug reports um it's easy to use our own experiences and uh go through the motions of using system one thinking and just taking notes of it um whereas trying to disprove your own bug um, requires a little bit more deep thinking. Yeah, and again, we are like getting back to it. The challenges that are connected to shifting left and to having developers help you with testing and to just like moving all the efforts to the early stages. All of the challenges here are somehow connected to this. Um, all the challenges that I that I have when talking to developers about testing and just making sure that they they switch their their thinking in, into the correct way for testing. All of them are somehow connected to to, to this uh, because it's testing is a very unnatural process for brains, right? Like looking for troubles is unnatural, and um, just like trying to always be in the in the system two mode of thinking is very unnatural it's it's energy heavy and many of the things we do are not very normal for brain to do and we need to force the brain to do something something else or in 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 a different manner and all of these things that we talked about so far are somehow connected to this right when you take a look at them all of these challenges are always connected to this like people want to go the easy way brains want to go the easy way and we are the few people in the in the team who have it natural not to go that way well, and, even then like as testers we have our own biases and habits that oh definitely <laughs> that, that will fall on too Definitely, and and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, um, when you are trying to, uh, when a manager can, comes and, and they are like, hey, automate everything, what they are basically trying to do is to take all of the testing that we are doing, which is a difficult system to think in, very expensive, um, think we are doing right and they are trying to shift it into a system one thinking basically uh that will be automated by by some machine mm. um right and then and when you think of it like automating the, the, the word itself is like yeah let's make it the easier kind of thinking um yeah the the the, the type of thinking that we can actually codify and and go is this correct yes no yeah <laughs> um and you know coming to that um analogy it it is quite 
quite a challenge to distill a software problem into a uh, yes no pass group uh, criteria too, right? Um, well, uh, it depends. Um, because what happens? Uh, oh, well, of course, yes, it is difficult, right? I, I will, I will agree with you there. What happens in reality is that people are substituting and they substitute um, acceptance criteria for uh, whatever needs to be testing. And it's easy to say, yes, this acceptance criteria is completed or not, like just check them off one by one. That is easy. Um, but the whole like testing software and with, with, with everything connected, that is definitely difficult. Um, and that is what is sometimes like not seen many times not seen. <laughs> cool. Well, what, what can you do in a team then to encourage a developer to use more of that deep thinking when it comes to testing? <sighs> yeah, this is a great question and I am currently in the stage of, of looking for answers to this question. <laughs> um, I have <laughs> I have tried several several things. I have several things I want to try. Uh, and it's definitely a slow process. Like patience is key here. Um, this is not something that can be done in a fortnight. This is something that needs to be done over many and many months. Um, what it distills to is basically making sure that anybody who is doing any sort of testing, in this case, it will be developers who will test their own work, right? To allow for, for testers to do something else um, or to allow for the teams not to have testers at all. That is also a possibility, right? Agile says that everybody can do anything. So, okay, let's make sure they are doing it well enough. Um, and so if, if we are like going this way, then what is important is to build like habits, basically, just to ma make sure that people get the right habits. And that is, that is what allows to like shift from system two to system one thinking because habits are system one thinking, right? And if people get the correct habits, then we can ensure that they will produce like good quality uh good quality stuff or that they will check for quality in in an appropriate manner um it's that good habits are producing good quality code basically and and this does go further away than just testing right it's if you have good if you have good habits about like clean code if you have good habits about like pushing to some vcs or gator somewhere if you have good habits about I don't know, like doing comments to your code, like this all helps, right? And it all helps to build a quality product in, in the end. And now we have to like connect good habits of testing to, to all of this. So. What is, uh, what is the best habit that a tester has? Um, that's a great question. I think that tester needs to be curious to no end. Um, I, I just, I just don't see how a, I, I just don't see how somebody could be a good tester without being curious. Like to always ask why something is happening, um, to always try and go down to the underlying issues, always try to dig deeper. Um, yeah, like that, that sort of curiosity is, is probably the, the best habit. And, and also the will to learn things is a great habit for tester because we always encounter something new and we always have to learn about things. Right. Yeah. I think that that curiosity mindset, it's like, um, the analogy I want to make, it's like approaching software, like a five-year-old. You know, you you go uh you deal with five year olds. Um, you tell them something is the way it is, and they go, "Why? Why? 
Yeah. Why? And 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 we and we unfortunately like force this out of kids in in school, but it's it's great when when people stay curious all their life. Like I loved it. Um and yeah, I I mean most of the testers I know are the people who when they asked why when they were five, their parents explained uh patiently. Um I have like they didn't their parents who will be like, Yeah, because and they will turn around and, and go away, right? But the testers I know are people who never got their curiosity flame uh blown out. Um <laughs> but you brought up a learning mindset. Um are you learning what are you learning at the moment? I'm learning all the time something. I I I would even say that like it is a big part of the job. First of all, like if somebody hires an expert in a field, um they need to learn constantly, right? To stay expert in the field. And I want to believe that I am, if not expert, then at least on the way to being one. <laughs> and that means I, I have to learn a lot of stuff. I, I am always reading something, either some blog or some book or something. I'm trying to attend like conferences. And these are just like the, the professional things, right? And then I am a big generalist and I learn in a very tangential way. Um, so anything that just grabs my curiosity, I try to learn about. I, I have huge collection of useless facts and trivia in my mind that I really cherish. I, um, yeah, I, I think they are really cool, although nobody ever wants to hear them. <laughs> and and it's it's this kind of like, and it's again like curiosity, right? It's curiosity and learning. I am curious about something, and I learn something about it. And it's every day. It's it's the day when I don't learn something is a day that I must have slept through because every day I learn something. Well, then, when when you're approaching, when you're using a learning mindset, there's also this uh, counterpoint to that is that sometimes knowledge becomes out of date and you have to unlearn some things. Have you ever had to unlearn anything? Um, definitely. Uh although like nothing comes into mind right now i would mm, say relearn is better than unlearn because it's either you have no idea that your knowledge is out of date or if you have idea that your knowledge is out of date it's because you were shown some knowledge that is better newer um better like maybe supported by by some research or something and then you just have to adjust the knowledge that you already had, but it, it gets replaced by this new knowledge, right? It's very, very, very rarely that you need to completely unlearn something. It's more like relearning stuff. Mm. Yeah, I think the, the analogy I might make is that um, some people who have had like fairly long tech careers, um, they might have worked in more waterfall projects and uh, maybe they went through some sort of certification. Uh, I think Prince Prince Two was like the the standard pro project management uh qualification ten fifteen years ago. I don't know, might have been mm -hmm. a bit older. Um, and now it's all Scrum certified master, <laughs> which which in itself is like a silly title, but it's it's what people are calling these things these days, right? Yeah. Um. I, I I see that. Okay, that there is a a little bit of unlearning to be done, definitely. <laughs> yeah, and if you're if you're used to projects being fairly long form and there being certain documentation to be produced at different stages, um, and then if you're trying to learn a better way, um, or a leaner way to that, that's again like going to the curiosity and to always asking why, right? Why should I do something in this way? And if I have a good reason why to do it, then then go ahead. If I don't have a good reason to do it this particular way, then we should probably find something else that will fit better. It's it's and the same thing with like looking for tools, right? Like there shouldn't be, in my opinion, there shouldn't be 
a point in time where you go for a tool just because, just because it has been a go-to or for a process, just because, just because it was a go-to. There needs to be a good reason to use it. So if there is a good reason to use waterfall, okay, go ahead. But if there is none, then maybe we should look for a process that will offer a good reason to be used. And many times you need to start in a different way. Many, many times you need to start by identifying what you want to achieve and then start picking a tool for that, right? And Or a process or something. But you need to know the why. You need to know what you want to achieve. You, you need to know why you are going, going to do this. And, and then you can like fit something. If you are doing it this way, there will not be a point in time where you will pick a tool just because you are used to it. Hmm. I I actually think we're pretty close to to time, and I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, <laughs> I think for a for a final sentiment, um, imagine there was a computer science graduate just finished uni. They're studying in Belgium for some weird reason, and they just so happen to watch this video on YouTube. And they're considering a career in software testing. Do you have any advice for this for this student? Um, I have helped several people start their career in testing. Um, my advice always is, you need to be sure you want to do this. Um, testers are very much outcasts of the team at times. Um, even though we can do the best we we know to stay with the team, and I have always had great relationships with all the developers and everything. It so happens that we do think differently than the rest of the team, and there needs to be a good reason why to be a tester. So if you are a curious one, if you love to learn new stuff, if you look for the problems and you enjoy that, go ahead, become a tester, you will love it. If you want to be a tester because you want to get into IT and then transfer to, I don't know, developer, and you really don't care about this, maybe find a different way how to how to creep in um, because you will not be happy and people you are working with will not be happy. So, um, yeah, just give it a good thought, and and if you if you still think that this is the job for you, go ahead. Uh, every new tester is so welcome. There is so little of us, and the craft is so undervalued sometimes, even though it's so interesting. Um, yeah, every new tester is welcome. Ah uh, yes, um, if you do choose a career as a software tester, you'll constantly be trying to articulate what value you bring to a company and you'll have people question why you do things and why you exist, why do we even need your skills, can't we automate everything. Anyway, it's a, um, it's a challenging path, um, but it can be uh, enjoyable. Very, and very rewarding. <laughs> Yes, and I would say uh, financially speaking, I guess, early career, um, there is, and at least here in Australia, um, there is a pay gap difference of about 10k per year for graduates, for developers versus testers. So um, there is a, a difference, a disparity in salary starting out. Um, but as you develop more skills and more expertise and more of a reputation, that can even itself out. But um, that's just another side benefit, but it can be easy to feel undervalued and underappreciated early on in your career too. I think I would agree with it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, thank you for joining our live stream today. I will put it up on uh, YouTube in after 24 hours after this goes live. And uh, I hope you all learned something new today because uh, I certainly did. Thank you for having me. It was it was a blast. <laughs>